Hi, my name is Lou Evans, and this is Plateau Valley's Livestock History. When I think of the Plateau Valley, I am reminded of the song, Colorado. There's a place where Mother Nature's got it all together. She knows just when to let the wildflowers bloom. Somehow she seems to know exactly what she is doing. And the Lord saw fit to furnish elbow room. I'd love to be there early in the morning. The sun comes up and crowns the mountain king. If you dare to be high up on the mountain, I swear you can hear the angels sing. That must have been what the pioneers thought as they settled into their new homes. They were people who were rugged and bold. They arrived in valleys and wagons, drawn by horses or mules that could carry only the bare necessities of life. A roll of bedding, a grub box, a sheet iron stove, water buckets, a plow, a log chain, pick, shovel, axe, and a bell for the milk cow. Everything else remained for them to produce one way or another. Some managed to bring a few chickens or hogs or a milk cow along with their work and riding horses. Everything else they nurtured from that original stock, sharing with others as circumstances permitted until they created a thriving community. They settled this beautiful valley. Their descendants live here today. They were rugged and bold individuals, for only those kind can survive the rigors of this wonderful but demanding lifestyle, which is livestock production. Demanding yet rewarding, hard work but strengthening, dirty yet cleansing, frustrating yet contenting, low in pay but rich in happiness, long hours yet freedom, that is ranching. It was a quest for freedom that made the men cross unknown oceans and deserts and strange lands. Desire for freedom has even led to wars. But give a man freedom and he becomes responsible for his actions. Then he believes in himself and his ability to succeed comes to life. With freedom and independence, he can build a home filled with love and peace and contentment. Attaining a measure of happiness, a heaven right here on earth. Plateau Valley lies on the north side of the Grand Mesa, which is a huge flat topped mountain rising 10,000 feet above the sea level and some 4,000 to 5,000 feet above the valley's floors. There are approximately 53 square miles of area on its top that hold 380 lakes. Its perimeter is some 60 miles long. Plateau Valley, lying on its northern edge, covers an area of about 30 miles long and 15 miles wide. The valley is semi-isolated, being bordered by the Grand Mesa on the south and Battlement Mesa on the north. It is hemmed by canyons to the west and smaller mountains to the east, effectively isolating the valley from any other nearby agricultural areas. Plateau Valley's livestock history started a half a century later than other parts of Colorado, due to the fact that Plateau Valley was still Indian territory. While other parts of the state were being settled, it was not until 1881, after the Meeker Massacre, that the Indians were pushed out of the area and settled in Utah. Then Plateau Valley, along with the Gunnison River Basin and the Grand Junction area, were opened for settlement. The first settlers to arrive were the Hawkshurst family, Tom and Sarah and their three sons, Tom, John, and Alex, and their daughter Mary, and her husband, Horace Dunlap. In October of 1881, they traveled up Surface Creek along a military road that had been established in previous years by the Army to secure timber to build the military cantonment 
eight miles south of present Montrose, when the army was in charge of the Indians of the area. The Hawkshurst crossed over the Grand Mesa and down Leon, Leon Creek to the Vega area, where they built a cabin. John and Tom returned to Gunnison to obtain supplies for the coming winter, a 150 mile trip. It snowed heavily during their return and they barely made it home where they were isolated from the world for the winter. The winter was long and the snow was very deep. So the following year they moved down country to an area near Colburn where they homesteaded. On March 7, 1882, the Dunlop's daughter, Harriet, was the first white child born in the Plateau Valley and also Mesa County. That spring, John and Tom returned to Gunnison for more supplies. Due to the deep snowpack on the Grand Mesa, they circled the west end of the Grand Mesa before heading east to Gunnison. On their return, they were followed by J.P. Brown, who then cut a wagon road out of Vega to the lower part of Plateau Valley, where he settled near what is presently the town of Mesa. Brown brought 30 head of cattle he had purchased from the army that had been furnishing cattle to the Utes in accordance to their treaty with the federal government. Kimball brought stock cattle to the valley in about 1882 and wintered them on Kimball Creek on the north side of the valley. J.F. Brink and George Stoddard brought crosses of Whiteface and Durham over the hogback into Mesa area. In 1883, Mac Miller and Ed Henry brought cattle from Texas. In 1883, Fred Mygator walked into the valley and in 1895, turned some cattle onto the Big Creek Range. D.M. Webb and sons Leonard Dame and Charlie Coyne turned horses onto the Big Creek Range. Goyne also brought in some Hereford cattle. Other early cattlemen were Bill Kenny, Fred Roswell, Doyle, Smith, Bailey, Soren Rasmussen, Harrison, Joe King, J.C. Dunlap, Middleton, Joshua Barnes, Dittman, Dave Anderson, John Fitzpatrick, Charles Libby, Rockwell, J.J. Lang, Adams, and Bill Stites. Parker and Adams brought a carload of bulls into what is now called Parker Basin. But Parker's cows never came, so he moved them out of the valley. Other people arrived to claim homesteads, and by the early 1900s, the whole valley was booming with settlers. At first, most homesteaders were lucky to have enough livestock to provide sustenance for their families. Their milk cows' heifer calves were kept and bred probably to the usual breed of the time, Shorthorn. Then Joe Bragg brought in some purebred Herefords, and by the turn of the century, they were leading the leading breed. Beef animals were usually three to four years old when shipped to market. In about 1898, Harold Porter topped the Denver market, getting five cents a pound for his steers. In 1899, Jess and John Snipes of the Molina District received a blue ribbon for their carload of beef cattle at the Denver Livestock Show. As time passed and the ground became more and more productive, the settlers enlarged their herds of livestock, mostly cattle. They built ditches to provide water and to grow crops. Reservoirs were built to supplement the stream flow. Occasionally, reservoirs failed but bigger and better ones replaced them. Roads were developed that made it easier to transport and produce livestock to population centers and to obtain goods needed for better life. A trip to Grand Junction for supplies took three days. During the 1880s, large livestock operators from out of the area started moving huge herds of sheep and cattle in to graze the plentiful forage of the valley. Brink brought 12 to 1,500 head of cattle from Utah. In 1890, a Mormon outfit 
brought 40,000 to 60,000 head of sheep in. The big cow outfits would move their cattle to the high country in July. The larkspur was so deadly before July that they stood to lose about half of their cow herd to the poison if they grazed it any earlier. In the fall, they would gather two or three year old steers for shipping if they were in good enough condition. The culls were left to be fend for themselves. In the winter, they moved the herds to the deserts. Those large outfits did rely only on supplement feeding during the winters and in some years suffered devastating losses. After a few years, they moved on to less difficult locations. The huge herds overgrazed all the area. On the sunny side, at the lower west end of the valley, grass that stood stirrup high when the white man first came was reduced to semi-desert. Erosion began cutting deep channels in the clay soil. Forest fires broke out. 50,000 head of sheep had been brought to graze the area and local ranchers thought the sheepmen had set fire on the mountain. Another theory was that a man by the name of Frank McCaney had started the fires so he could be hired to fight the fire. He was a part-time employee of Radcliffe who owned patented land on the Grand Mesa around Alexander Lake where a major dispute had grown over local fishing rights in the lakes. That dispute came to an end after a Delta man was killed by McCaney, who was one of Radcliffe's wardens. The local community became so enraged they burned all of Radcliffe's buildings, destroying all his valuable collections brought from England along with the fish hatchery he had built to stock the lakes some of which had not had trout in them until the white man put them there. In 1888, about 10,000 head of sheep were brought in. The locals resented the huge herds of sheep overgrazing the forest, and they banded together to prevent any sheep from coming into the valley. They met each band with destruction, sometimes driving the herds over the cliffs shooting and maiming the sheep and some herders. They even destroyed a small band of local sheep and forced the owner to move out of the valley. Reuben Pitts described the combination of confrontation with the sheepmen in his book, The Bull and the Bees. In the early 1880s, a band of sheep was brought in from Utah and turned on Big Creek and Plateau Creek watersheds. There were no forest regulations at that time, and sheep roamed and stayed on the same grounds until the herders decided to move them. There were 3,000 in the band, and it didn't take long for the cattlemen, who were the settlers of the valley, but a short time to see what would happen if this range and if the sheep were not moved out at once. Cattlemen from three different counties of Western Slope met and appointed a committee to call on the owner of the band of sheep to try to convince them to move out. They must have used very convincing language as in August of that year the sheep were brought down the Salt Creek into the Peninsula Road and down Plateau Creek to Mesa then over the Hogback and on west into Utah. I was a small kid and it was the first sheep I had seen. It looked to me like this was all there was in the world, and it took that band from early morning until noon to pass our house. This was the beginning of the sheep and cattle war, which lasted for more than two years for the western slope of Colorado. The next spring is the first part of May, in the valley was shook by three giant dynamite blasts. And my older brother and I thought the big brass in Washington had moved the 4th of July back into May. Then, to make matters even more mysterious, within about an hour after the big booms, the road by our place was plenty busy with galloping horsemen, all armed with Winchesters and going west. 
The big boom had been set off somewhere at the west end of Plateau Valley, and it was warning signal that more woolies were on the way to invade our territory. From Utah, a band of 6,500 head of sheep was driven north from Grand Junction, and camp was made in the vicinity of the little town of Clifton. 2,500 head of this band were brought across the Colorado River and up Rapid Creek Road and headed over the hogback to Mesa. But it was on the hogback that they met their Waterloo. No men were killed, but practically all sheep were destroyed. The 4,000 heads still at Clifton were moved up the Colorado River to Parachute Creek and up this creek to its headwaters on the flat tops of Oil Shale Mountain and into the cattlemen's summer range. The herders were using the same tactics as they did on the Grand Mesa the year before, staying as long as they pleased in one place. This proved to be a sorry mistake. The herders were using what is called tight herding. This means pretty well bunched, especially on the bed grounds. They had been in this vicinity only a short time when a dark night, a band of men formed a semicircle around the sheep and opposite a canyon of the oil shale cliff. Rifle shots, barking dogs, cowbells, anything that would make a loud noise was used. And that band of sheep was stampeded over a thousand foot oil shale cliff into the gorge below. This ended the migration of sheep from our neighboring state in large numbers but it did not end the trouble for the early settlers of the valley. Snipers using Winchesters and shooting from ambush began taking pot shots at anyone wearing a big hat. And one rancher, Alec Long, who lived in Mesa, had his new Stetson punctured through the crown. The bullet singed the hair on the top of Alex's head, but was a little high off its mark. Alec and a cowhound were riding cattle in the vicinity of the hogback when it happened. But before the sniper could fire a second shot, six guns barked and the sniper lay wounded. The cowman put him up on his own horse and brought him to Mesa, where his wounds were treated by Doc Craig. The sniper was a, a basio, and when he was questioned, as to whom he was working for, he could not, or pretended he could not, understand English. He lived about a week, and when he died, it was reported the cause was to be pneumonia, but it could have been bullettitis. There were a few more pot shots at Big Hats up and along the Colorado River. The snipers seemed to be poor marksmen until the spring of 1894 when Sylvester McCarty, who was a cattle rancher and had been appointed road maintenance man for the upper part of Plateau Valley, was working the road four miles west of Colburn when he was shot from ambush. He was found by John Carmichael Sr., who was carrying the U.S. mail from Debec to Colburn. Carmichael brought McCarty to our house where he died that evening. He was shot with a rifle bullet which passed through his right side. According to Helen Young in her book, Skin and Bones, even small local bands of sheep were destroyed during that time. The degradation of the forest by the huge herds of cattle and sheep prompted the formation of the Grand Mesa and Battlement Mesa National Reserve. It was created December 24, 1892 amid much local resistance. It covered an area of 866,400 acres, which were set aside in the preserve for the land for water, timber, and mineral resources. Later reductions left it at 665,000 acres. In 1905, the Forest Service was created, and in 1924, the area was renamed Grand Mesa National Forest. According to the Forest Service history, in the 1870s and 1880s, before the Indians were moved out, 
a large number of fires had raised the forest. It was speculated that the Indians sent fires to help control the wildlife for their own use. During the 1893 massive forest fire, consumed much of the forest on the Grand Mesa and Battlement Mesa. Since 1882 up to 1950, 14 fires had burned and they had destroyed 516 acres. The implementation of the Forest Service stabilized the livestock industry. Permits for grazing on federal lands were issued with local people given priority. With the animal growth of the grass being consumed by livestock rather than being left standing, the incidence of forest fires had diminished. Between 1920 and 1928, some 38,000 to 50,000 head of cattle grazed on the Grand Mason Forest. Today, 5,835 cattle use the forest along with many fishermen, hunters, hikers, sightseers, campers, loggers, and snowmobilers in all-terrain vehicles. The valley prospered through the 20s. Many settlers relied on the cream check for their maintenance and their sustenance. Each family would keep several milk cows, milking them night and morning, separating the cream from the whole milk. Then the cream was delivered to the local creameries. There were several in the valley. Some settlers made butter and a few made cheese. During the summer months, part of the family might move to the high country where the forage was better than in the valley. They would keep the cream and butter cool in the cool springs and streams and about once a week hauled it 15 miles or so to the creamery. Purchased needed goods and returned the next day. By the 1950s, the local creameries had closed and the cream was shipped to Cedar Edge for processing. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, the residents were mostly self-sufficient and did not suffer as much as their industrialized neighbors. The local bank, recently located in a nice new building, managed to remain open. A few enterprising folk raised goats chickens, turkeys, honeybees, and fish. A number of ranchers raised large bunches of horses for sale, as well as for their own needs. In the 1950s, whole milk became a profitable product, and several dairies, perhaps 50, were established. Later, the health department made them put the milk in a pipeline milkers and stainless steel cooling tanks. The cost causing many of the smaller dairies to go out of business. There may have been 2,000 dairy cows in the valley at that time. Today, there are no dairies in the Plateau Valley. The last one, the Young Brothers, went out of business about 1996. Nearly every settler had some pigs. They were useful for eating kitchen garbage in excess skim milk and they made delicious bacon, ham, sausage, roasts, and ribs. Some enterprising ranchers raised so many they would drive them to the railhead at Debec to sell them in Denver. In later years, trucks were used to get them to market. Ranchers dug in and continued to raise their livestock. New equipment became available. By the 1940s, it became easier to ship livestock by truck than to drive them to the railhead at Debec. New bloodlines were introduced, improving the quality of the offspring so that nowadays, 18-month-old calf will be ready for butchering, a far cry from the three to five-year-old steer of the early days. Dean Walk was one of the first valley ranchers to do artificial insemination and others soon followed, having observed that the operation could improve the productivity of their herds. They also started keeping individual records on each animal's age, weaning weight, and conformation that helped in deciding which animals to retain in their herd. They found certain breeds of cattle resisted brisket disease, and the crossbreeding could add an extra 200 pounds of weight at weaning time. The ranch business had waxed and waned the vagaries of commerce and weather. 
Some years were horrid with drought, low prices and insects. Others were good with good crop and higher prices. Some gave up and moved on, selling to others more determined to stay who enlarged their holdings. Many ranchers added outside work to keep their ranchers afloat. Their women learned that they could take jobs outside the home and work just five days a week instead of staying home seven days a week, tending milk cows, chickens, pigs, and gardens. Today the valley annually sends about 5,000 head of feeder animals to feedlots to be finished for slaughter. There are no huge ranch operations, though several ranches of 500 head or more exist. And until recently, a few raised sheep. Small herds still exist in the valley. A few ranchers have remained in the same family for over 100 years. Stoddard, Courier, Gunderson, Harris, Hill, Hiddle, and Beezer. They are listed in the Colorado State Registry of Centennial Farms as having owned the same ground for 100 years. Many other families in the valley have roots going back more than 100 years, but in keeping with the moving on, they have not owned the same property during that 100 years. The Plateau Valley Historical Preservation Society has designated them Centennial Families.